Well, good morning. Do you guys remember this game? If you've had kids, how could you forget? I mean, that shoots in ladders. I mean, the goal of the game is to travel the hundred spaces and get to the finish line before your opponent. But, but along the way, as you know, you encounter shoots and ladders. If you land on a ladder, then you get to climb ahead of the competition. But if you encounter a chute, you slide back and have to cover the same ground again. Now, kids hate it when they land on a chute. But nothing brings a child more joy than landing on a ladder and being vaulted ahead of everyone else. Now, chutes and ladders, well, that's a kid's game. But did you know in our culture today, we still have adults attempting to climb ladders? I mean, you could say we live in Ladderville. There are ladders all around us uh, with people on them trying, attempting to climb to the top. Now, I don't know what your ladder might be. I mean, it could be success. It might be money. It could be accomplishment, or maybe it's appearance. It might be popularity or approval. I mean, every one of us has a ladder we're attempting to climb. But the problem with living in Ladderville is that um, once you get on a ladder, it's hard to get off. And that's because every step you take, gives you a little twinge of pleasure, but it never lasts. Now, the other issue with living in Ladderville is that uh, we don't pay much attention to the people lower than us on the ladder. You see, when you're climbing a ladder, you're always facing upward. Now, Jesus knows we live in a culture uh, that's trying to sell us ladders no one needs. As human beings, what we need is what no one is really selling. In fact, that's the very message Jesus wants to get across to his disciples in Matthew, in Mark chapter 9. If you would turn there with me, beginning in verse 30, I want us to look at what nobody sells but every one of us in this room needs. Notice how Mark begins, verse 30. Then they departed from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know it. For he taught his disciples and said to them, The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise on the third day. But they did not understand this saying and were afraid to ask him. Now I want you to notice that Jesus, as Jesus' time of death draws near, he begins to spend less time with the multitudes and focuses his attention primarily on his twelve disciples. That's why Mark says he didn't want anyone to know they were passing through Galilee. So as they're making their way toward Jerusalem, or toward uh, um, Capernaum, uh, Jesus opens up with the twelve. He tells them about his impending betrayal and death. But the disciples didn't want to hear such things. Their minds were elsewhere. Look at the next verse, verse 33. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? But they kept silent, for on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. Now, we don't know how that discussion came about. I suspect it was precipitated by the events at the beginning of this chapter. Do you remember at the beginning of chapter 9, what we saw last week, that Jesus invites Peter, James, and John to go where no man has gone before. They accompany Jesus into the mountains where he allows them to see the most amazing sight, his unveiled glory. But not only that, they get to see Jesus have a conversation with two dead men. Moses and Elisha. And then, after it's over, Jesus swears those three to secrecy. You can't tell anyone. So you can imagine they're coming down from the mountain. 
Uh, Peter, James, and John uh, meet up with the other nine disciples. The, one of the other nine says, hey, y'all were up there a long time, weren't you? I mean, wh- what, did, what did y'all do up there? And one of the three goes, huh, well, w- well, we're not allowed to say. In other words, my ladder's bigger than your ladder. And what ensued was an argument, argument about who would be the greatest of all of them. And they have this argument. You see, in, in the heart of every man is a desire to know that his life matters. That he's important. That what he says and what he does has significance. Uh, You see, in the heart of every man, there is a desire for greatness. The desire for greatness is found in the heart of every man and woman. Now, this desire for greatness is normal. It's not wrong. It's not sin. Not at all. But, But the latter that takes us there is not what we expect. And Jesus wants us to recognize what that ladder looks like. That's what he does in verse the next verse, verse 35. He says, And he sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said, Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Now, did you notice Jesus doesn't rebuke them for wanting to be great? He never takes them to task for their ambition. You see, God has built inside the human heart a desire for significance. He doesn't reprimand them for wanting to be great, but He does want them to know exactly where greatness is found. In fact, I heard the story this week about two friends who went to dinner together. They both ordered a steak, medium or rare. After a little while, the waiter brought the steak to the table on a single platter. Both steaks were there. One was larger than the other. He set it on the table along with two plates. Uh, The first friend uh, grabbed the smaller steak, put it on a plate, and gave it to his friend. (laughs) His friend said, you sure have got the nerve. The first man said, well, what's your problem? He said, well, uh, do you see what you've done? I mean, you have taken the smaller steak and given it to me, and you've kept the larger steak for yourself. The first man said, well, what would you have done? He said, well, I guess if I was serving you, I would give you the larger steak. Well, said the first man, I've got it, so what's your complaint? (laughs) Now, that's the way the world views greatness. The world says if you want to be great, you've got to take control, you've got to be in charge, you've got to rule. But Jesus says, no, no, if you want to be great, you've got to serve. You see, in God's economy, true greatness is found in service. Now, I want you to notice how Jesus said it to the disciples. He said, if anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. I mean, what Jesus is really saying is there there are really two kinds of greatness, two kinds of ambition. There is the ambition to be applauded by men, and there's the ambition to be applauded by God. I mean, the world over here says, how, ask the question, how many uh, serve me? How many do I exercise power over? How do I get the upper hand? But over here, Jesus is asking, how many do you serve? How many do you assist? How can I help? Now, the question I have is, why in the world does Jesus raise service to the pinnacle, saying that is the key to greatness? Well, several years ago, when I was in Colorado, I had an appointment with the mayor of Woodland Park, Colorado. I wanted uh, to volunteer our church to do a makeover of the old train depot, 100-year-old train depot that was in downtown Woodland Park that 
was in bad need of renovation. And when I did, it just surprised the mayor that we would offer to do such a thing. He said, the churches I know of and associated with are always coming to the city and asking for stuff. You're wanting to give to the city. And as we talked about it, he said, yeah, by all means, please. We'd love for you to do that. And so we did a makeover of the depot. And when we finished, I mean, it looked fantastic. It was great. Which led to having uh, several more appointments and then lunch with the mayor. And in one of those lunches, I decided that I would invite him uh, to participate in the quest for authentic manhood that was going to be starting up. Uh, in fact, at that time, I was teaching the quest for authentic manhood in the city library on Wednesday mornings at 6 a.m. And to my surprise, he said he'd like to come. And to my shock, he came. He came and didn't miss a single one. And then at the end of the quest for authentic manhood, he gave a plan in that I asked the guys to, to write. And with it, he included this. He said, God had granted me the opportunity to be a part of the quest for authentic manhood. He helped wrestle me out of bed every Wednesday morning and gave me safe passage to the library, which, by the way, was no small task since we lived at 8,500 feet up in the Rockies where sometimes there would be three, four feet of snow on the ground. God wanted that for me. So today I have a new relationship with Jesus. It's a new relationship that has given me the strength uh, to address old issues and face future challenges. And it all started because of what? A willingness to serve. You see, when you serve, you get invited into places the mighty are not permitted to go. That's the power of service. Now, to drive his point home, Jesus calls a child out of the crowd and puts his arms around him. And he says this to his disciples, whoever receives one of these children in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Now, why does Jesus use a child to illustrate his point that greatness is found in service? Well, when you think about it. A child has little or no influence. A, ch a child, he can't advance your career. A child can't enhance your status. A child can't give you anything. In fact, just the opposite. A, a child demands things. A child uh, needs stuff done for him. A child has to be taken care of. You see, our tendency is to focus on what others can do for me, for us. We want to associate with people that make us feel good, that enhance our status. But Jesus says that true greatness is found in serving others like the small child. Now, if that's true, then serving can't be done out of a heart of pride. In fact, Jesus is going to tell the disciples it has to be done out of a heart of humility. Now, it's at this time John begins to think of something that recently happened, and uh, he kind of interrupts Jesus to ask him about it. Look at verse 38. And John answered him, saying, Teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us cast out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow us. Now, we don't know why John thought of this situation and felt like he needed to bring it up. I mean, perhaps when, when Jesus said, whoever receives uh, one of these little children in my name, and John goes, whoa, well, wait a minute, there was that guy that was <clears throat> casting out demons in Jesus' name. And suddenly John realizes that in confronting that man, uh, he was doing that not out of a heart of service, but a heart of arrogance. It's arrogant. It's pride that says, you know, only God can only work through our small group. And so he asked Jesus about it, and Jesus responds in verse 39. He said, do not forbid him, for no one who works a miracle in my name can soon afterwards speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is on our side. 
Now, with those words, Jesus really deals a death blow to this attitude that says our group is the only group that's got it right. You know, the church has been doing that for years. Drawing lines in the sand, saying if you don't believe what we believe, we can't associate with you. You don't do communion the way we do it. You don't say the Lord's Prayer the way we do it, then we won't have anything to do with you. But really, it's worse than that. I mean, we'll talk behind your back. We'll run you down in the community, and Jesus wants us to know that when that happens, it destroys God's intent behind serving. You know, when you serve, you open people's eyes to what God is like. There's something mystical about serving because, you see, God was a servant. Uh, When we serve others, we really more fully represent the image of God to those who don't know Him on this earth. But not only that, our hearts then begin resonating with the same thing God's heart resonates with. God's a server. In fact, Paul talks about how Jesus served when he wrote the church in uh, Philippi. Notice what he says. Speaking of Jesus, who being in the form of God, he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a servant. You see, the life of Christ is not the story of someone who climbed up a ladder. No, the life of Christ is the story of someone who climbed down. I mean, he was up here at the top, at the pinnacle of the organizational chart of the universe. But he didn't consider it something to hang on to, to cling to. Instead, he he gave up his right to have his way and became a servant. He became a human being. He took on flesh and blood. Our needs and our limitations became His. Did you know that's one of the reasons Christianity spread so quickly in the first three centuries of its birth? In fact, a lecturer and sociologist, an author, Rodney Clark, in his book, The Rise of Christianity, Uh, uh, identifies and documents how the early church turned the world upside down by what they did. Uh, In his book, he says that the early first century Christ followers uh, organized relief projects for the poor. They, They ransomed their friends from barbarian captors that they released freely their own slaves. He went on to say that when the plagues hit, that uh, those who didn't know Christ would abandon their friends and even family members at the first hint of symptoms. But these Christ followers would move in and care for those that were sick, even those who didn't know Christ, many of them succumbing to the sickness themselves. He went on to say that when Romans started abandoning their unwanted children to the elements and to wild animals, it was the church that organized platoons of wet nurses to keep the children alive until they could be adopted by families in the church. In fact, in the waning days of the empire, he went on to say that the whole world set up and paid attention. They flocked to churches because they were the only evidence of a caring community in the empire. In fact, in 360 A.D., the pagan emperor Julian said this, You could stick it up on the screen. Uh, These impious Galileans not only feed their own poor, but ours also. While the pagan priests neglect the poor, the hated Galileans devote themselves to works of charity. You see, you may never be more like God than when you serve. But Jesus also wants you to know that your serving doesn't go unrewarded. I mean, look what he says next. He says, For whoever gives a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, assuredly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. He's 
saying that just the slightest act of service can have significant impact, even if it's just giving a cup of water to someone. But the impact is not just outward on the community. What he's saying is the one who serves is the one who's going to be rewarded. In other words, the slightest act of service ends up impacting you. And haven't we seen that happen here at Horizon time and time again? I mean, I think of the doctors and nurses that serve in Belize in less than ideal conditions, providing medical attention to the poorest of the poor. Upon arriving back in the States, the first words out of their mouth is, it was fun, I loved it. This is why I became a doctor. This is why I became a nurse. Or maybe you've participated in our care for orphans, helping with back-to-back in Mexico. And people who come back say to their friends, this, this serving of orphans was the most significant thing they did all year. But if you don't believe that, all you got to do is go out in the atrium and ask Bob Mason, who greets people at the front door, if greeting parents and kids is not the highlight of his entire week. You see, serving impacts you. It impacts your life. And one of the reasons it does that is because serving is actually fun. But but in case the disciples didn't catch the weight of what Jesus was saying about serving... He issues them a warning in the next verse, verse 42. He says, But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and they were thrown into the sea. And when Jesus talks about the little ones who believe, he's he's talking about those who've not been Christ's followers very long. He says, when you and I refuse to serve, to engage in the lives of other people, that those who are not very long in the faith get discouraged. They want to throw in the towel. They want to give up. They look at us and go, they're no different than everyone else I know. And so they give up. You see... The mark of a believer who's walking closely with God is a heart to love through service. So true service is going to require personal humility. But secondly, Jesus wants us to know that true service is going to provide, uh, require personal evaluation. In fact, you might want to buckle your seat belts because what Jesus says next is a little hard to swallow. Look at verse 43 says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that is never will never be quenched where worm does not die and fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame rather than having two feet and be cast into hell into the fire that shall never be quenched, where worm does not die and fire is not quenched. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where worm does not die and fire is not quenched. For everyone will be seasoned with fire and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Yikes. I mean, what in the world is Jesus talking about there? I mean, the first time I read that, I thought, oh, I want to skip that. I don't want to cover it. But, it. but as it became apparent what Jesus meant by saying that, I couldn't wait to share it with you. You see, Jesus is using a very dramatic analogy to tell us the seriousness of embracing selfish attitudes that keep us from engaging in service. Now, the word hell there is the Greek word Gehenna. It happens to be the very same name, Gehenna, of a valley right outside of Jerusalem. And this valley was kind of the garbage dump of Jerusalem. It's where they would pile up their refuse and burn it. Fire smoldered there 24-7. Worms ate the garbage and food. I mean, as Jesus uses the word Gehenna, it has nothing to do with hell versus heaven. The word Gehenna becomes analogous as time went on for a place of waste, of loss. 
So when it's applied to the Christ follower, as Jesus does here, he's talking about a life that is squandered, that's wasted, a life that has been totally misspent. What he's saying is the way to avoid a wasted life is to ruthlessly evaluate ourselves in light of serving. Where am I willing to serve? I mean, where am I willing to offer my energy? Where am I becoming the sweet aroma to those around me? A sweet aroma of Christ. So when Jesus says, cut your hand off, he's not literally talking about removing our hands. The hand is a figure of speech for our actions. He's saying that if our self-focused actions are stinking up around the world around you so that people can't smell the sweet aroma of Christ in you, then remove it. Stop those actions. And if your foot is on a path that discredits the cause of Christ, sever it. Get off the path, in other words. That's the figure of speech. And if your eyes are looking at things that bring dishonor to Christ, he says, pluck it out. In other words, quit looking at that stuff. I mean, can you see what he's saying? I mean, his point is very simple. It's instead of serving self, serve others. And you won't have a wasted life. So Jesus is saying serving is going to require personal humility personal evaluation, but he concludes by saying serving others is going to require personal usefulness. Notice how he puts it in verse 50. He says, salt is good, but if the salt loses its flavor, how will you season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace with one another. Now, uh, in Jesus' day, salt was used to do two things, to preserve meat, especially fish. You could salt it down and preserve it. And it was also used to bring out the flavor in foods. Now, you need to know their salt was completely different from the salt we use today. Our common table salt is 100% pure. Their salt came from, well, the Dead Sea. It had all sorts of impurities in it. So when it began losing its effectiveness, it was good for nothing. It just was thrown out. So when Jesus says, have salt in yourselves and have peace with one another, he's talking about serving in such a radical way that it brings out the flavor in life. He's saying that when we serve, we discover a zest for living and others begin to take notice. And it brings out the flavor in their life as well. It has a multiplied impact. In fact, I remember a number of years ago, uh, volunteering to work in uh, the St. Thomas Housing Project in kind of the poorest area of New Orleans. And our team was going down to live for two weeks, and our job was to work in the projects to clean the uh, apartments and disinfect them and repaint them for the residents there. And it was grueling work. In fact, I remember walking into one lady's apartment, and she'd been there 15 years. I don't think it had ever been cleaned, and she had kept every margarine tub she had used in those 15 years, a whole wall, floor to ceiling, stacked up. They had never been cleaned. Roaches were rampant. Well, we worked long, grueling days. We would clean, throw stuff away, disinfect, clean the walls, and then repaint them. I mean, uh, when we would quit in the evening, we'd go back to these hardwood floors we were living on and just collapse on them, and we slept like babies. Well, when I returned back to work two weeks after being in New Orleans two weeks, I noticed this gal just she would look at me across the room and kind of smile. And after about a half a day of seeing her look at me, I had all I could take. I went up to her and I said, Merle, what, what? Why are you looking at me like that and smiling? And a big grin came across her face. She said, you know, ever since you got back from New Orleans, you're different. You know what I think? God did something in you down there. You know, she was right. You see, that's what God does 
when we begin taking on the mantle of service. You guys remember the, the movie, How the Grinch Stole Christmas with Jim Carrey? came out a decade ago or so. I mean, in the movie, the Grinch attempts to ruin Christmas by stealing the presents, but that movie has a surprise kind of happy ending. You remember what happens when the Grinch gives the presents to the kids at the end? Here's what the narrator says. Well, in Whoville, they say that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. In other words, his capacity to love, uh, to feel compassion, began expanding exponentially as he got his eyes off himself and began to focus on others and what it means to serve them. I want to talk to the men just for a moment here. Guys, you want to enlarge your heart. You want to expand your capacity to love your family, I mean your wife and your kids. You need to know one of the things that has to be addressed in every man's life are the wounds every man faces that keeps his heart pinned down, that keeps him from doing what he longs to do, what he wants to do, uh, desires to do, but just can't seem to muster the ability to do it. If those wounds go unaddressed, it creates a driven man, a controlling man, and eventually an angry man. Or on the flip side, it creates a passive man or addictive behaviors or addictive man. And they need to be addressed. And that's one of the things that we're going to be talking about with men in the quest for authentic manhood I mentioned earlier. It's starting in a month. The details are in your program. I want to encourage you to come. And in it, you'll begin to see a freedom of living and engaging and doing what you know You've wanted to do but hadn't been able to do, to live by the masculine heart God has given you. And all it's going to require is just one thing, getting up early once a week. That's it. And I guarantee you if you come, at the end, you will see the benefit. You'll thank me for it. Your, your wife and kids will eventually see the benefit as well. Because your heart will begin to enlarge. Your capacity for compassion will begin Uh, to become greater. Now, that's exactly what Jesus wants to teach the disciples, how to enlarge their hearts, how to increase their ability to love by serving others. It's the lesson He wants them to learn, and it's the same lesson He's teaching today. Father, thank You for Jesus' very poignant words. I, I am the first to confess that I just don't naturally lean toward thinking of others more than myself. And I can think of a bazillion excuses why I don't want to do certain things. But, Father, every time you move in my life to get me to serve, on the flip side, I end up saying, I'm glad I did that. Would you use your spirit, Father, and these verses to move us to get our eyes off ourselves and see the needs of others and give us the courage then to serve them by helping meet those needs. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to thank you for coming. If you came prepared to give, offering boxes are right outside the door. In fact, if this is your first time at Horizon, let me encourage you to drop by the hearth room. We would love to greet you down there. It's the third door to the left. Enjoy the rest of your day, and thanks for coming.